of World News Tonight. International Aid As massive new explosions rock Ukrainian cities, global superpowers come together in providing a helping hand. From refugee shelters all the way to more ammunition, Ukraine stands its ground with the aid of many. Seething Sanctions in a surprising move, Switzerland, long being neutral of the situation in Ukraine, has joined forces of the EU in causing economic chaos within Russia. The sanctions now causing mass panic amongst Russian citizens. Efficacy struggles. Pfizer, previously highly effective COVID jab, now cast into a shadow of doubt. The vaccine showing less than agreeable results among children, causing the company to further its search for a better cure. And colorful China. Lanterns bathe streets in the celebrating nation with spectacular views as tradition takes center stage. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with yet leading stories on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Five days into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the first round of talks near the border ended with no immediate conclusion. The head of Moscow's delegation, Vladimir Medlinsky, told reporters after the five-hour-long session that the envoys found certain points on which common positions could be foreseen. A top advisor to Ukrainian President Mikhailo Podolyak said the talks focused on a possible ceasefire but did not provide details. According to Medinsky, the next meeting will take place in the coming days on the Poland-Belarus border. Mikhailo Podolyak, the top advisor to the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, gave few details except to say that the talks focused on a possible ceasefire and that a second round could take place in the near future. Russia's actions in Ukraine have been casting an even more negative light on the country. As evidence continues to flow that the military conduct in Russia is carrying is not in fact in self-defense, but rather in an offensive manner across Ukraine. A worsening humanitarian catastrophe in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city today, the scene of street-to-street -street combat that left at least nine people dead, including three children and dozens injured. This is a residential area with no military objects. And added to mounting evidence that Vladimir Putin's war has put civilians in the crosshairs. A school destroyed not far from the center of the city. Missile fragments inside a residential apartment building. Today, the International Criminal Court launching a probe for war crimes against humanity. Maria Avdiva, a Kharkiv resident, shot this video inside Kharkiv at a children's clothing factory. Russia did much of this bombing while negotiating peace talks. This will happen with all enemies who will come here. Of most concern is the site of cluster munitions, bombs that open in midair and spray smaller bombs. It's clearly a cluster munition attack. We think that cluster munitions should never be used at all. They're banned by 110 countries, though not by Russia or the U.S. Still, the U.S. hasn't used them since the first Gulf War over 30 years ago. Their use by the Russians in Ukraine, another sign of this war's growing savagery. Switzerland, in an effort to abandon its traditionally neutral role in conflict, has finally picked a side. The country has officially joined the European Union on all sanctions applied towards Russia, claiming extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. In a sharp deviation from its traditional neutrality, Switzerland said on Monday that it will adopt all the sanctions that the EU has imposed on Russian people and companies and freeze their assets to punish Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Flanked by his finance, defense and justice ministers, Swiss President Ignacio Cassis said extraordinary times called for extraordinary measures. L'attack de la Russie contre l'Ukraine est inacceptable. Russia's attack against Ukraine is unacceptable with regards to international law, unacceptable politically speaking and unacceptable from a moral point of view. The Federal Council has decided to fully adopt the European Union sanctions, including asset freezing. Switzerland has steered clear of imposing sanctions in a string of past crises, including when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014, 
Switzerland on Monday also adopted financial sanctions against Russian President Vladimir Putin and other high-ranking officials effective immediately. EU Chief Joseph Burrell welcomed the move, calling it good news that transferring money to Swiss banks would no longer help Russian oligarchs. In another break from the norm, Germany said it will increase its military spending to 2 percent of GDP in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The EU's biggest economy had resisted pressure to increase its military spending in the past, owing to its 20th century history. The boost in spending lifted defense stocks in the U.S. and Europe on Monday, with shares of Lockheed Martin, Raytheon and Northrop Grumman all soaring, on pace for a third straight session of gains. As the Swiss joins in to sanction Russia, South Korea will also stop exporting strategic materials to Moscow and exclude Russian banks from the SWIFT banking system in line with international sanctions and the government is discussing further measures. As part of efforts to sanction Russia for its attack on Ukraine, the South Korean government has announced that it will cut off exports to Russia of strategic materials. These reportedly include materials designated as strategic by four multilateral export control regimes, including the Nuclear Suppliers Group and the Vassener Arrangement. Seoul's Foreign Affairs Ministry said on Monday that it notified the U.S. of the decision through a diplomatic channel. South Korea will also soon decide and announce what it will do with exports to Russia of materials classified as non-strategic, which the U.S. has also decided to restrict. The non-strategic materials include dozens of items such as chips, computers, information and communication devices, sensors and lasers, and goods related to navigation and aerospace. Washington has decided to require foreign companies making tech items with U.S. origin technology or software to seek a license from the U.S. Seoul has been reviewing the possible impact of the role on Korean companies. Seoul will also join the U.S. move to exclude Russian banks from the main international payment system, SWIFT, to further isolate the Russian economy. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine possibly disrupting global energy supplies, South Korea plans to release more oil reserves to stabilize global energy market and consider reselling liquefied natural gas to European countries. It also plans to increase humanitarian aid to Ukraine through international cooperation. In the meantime, Seoul and Washington are closely coordinating on the crisis in Ukraine. South Korean Defense Minister Ho spoke at the National Assembly on Monday, saying the two allies have held high-level talks about maintaining a robust joint defense posture regarding the situation. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has also taken action in responding to the crisis in Ukraine, chairing multiple high-level meetings on the country's strategic plans on sending aid and also recovering stranded Indian citizens who are mostly university students. Let's cross over to our Today in the World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar from Delhi in India for more. Gayatri. Yes, Anradi. According to the Indian Foreign Ministry, Modi noted that the first consignment of relief supplies to Ukraine to deal with the humanitarian situation on Ukraine's border would be dispatched. Modi revealed the ongoing efforts to bring back Indians stranded in Ukraine during the meeting. The Prime Minister said that the entire government machinery is working round the clock to ensure that all Indians there are safe and secure. Modi also stated that the India will help people from neighboring countries and developing countries who are stranded in Ukraine and may seek assistance. Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman said India's government is also worried about the impact on its exports to, due to the Ukrainian crisis. The ambassador of Ukraine to India, Igor Polika, said the number of Ukrainian refugees is increasing every day and can reach up to 7 million people if the war is not stopped. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar from Delhi in India. Furthermore, additional German Navy ships left the northern port of Kiel to reinforce NATO's northern flank as Alliant members rally in defense of Ukraine. To get more details on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponzo from Cleve in Germany. Inuka? Yes, Anuradi. The mine hunting boat Zulzberg Rosenberg and Homburg, the minesweeper Siegburg and the tender Elbe departed for the Baltic Sea. The departing vessels followed the corvette Erfurt 
and the fleet servant board Alster that left early under the motto, not on our watch. The ship's departure coincides with the policy shift that means Germany will now supply Ukraine with defensive anti-tank weapons, surface-to-air missiles and ammunition. After facing criticism for refusing to send weapons to Kyiv, unlike other Western allies, Chancellor Olaf Scholz said Berlin will supply Ukraine with 1,000 anti-tank weapons and 500 Stinger surface-to-air missiles from Bundeswehr stocks. Germany has a long-standing policy of not exporting weapons to war zones, rooted partly in its bloody 20th century history and resulting pacifism. Countries aiming to pass on German weapons exports need to apply for the approval in Berlin first. Back to you, Amradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Indico Ponzo from Cleve in Germany. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. U.S. President Joe Biden is not on the high road, it seems, as barricades re-emerged in preparation for his State of the Union address. However, the nation is uneasy with his terms in office, as inflation and other pressures rise exponentially. U.S. Capitol Police increasing security ahead of President Biden's State of the Union address. Concrete barriers, 12-foot black fencing, and enhanced police presence out of an abundance of caution. A major uptick in security for an annual tradition in a post-January 6 era. In last year's address to Congress, a newly inaugurated and optimistic Looking president. Back. We can do whatever we set our minds to if we do it together. So let's begin to get together. A year later, the country is deeply divided. A stalled democratic agenda, a chaotic exit from Afghanistan, inflation at a 40-year high, and COVID frustration all contributing to sagging poll numbers. Just 37 percent of respondents approve of Biden's handling of the presidency and 55 percent disapprove. His handling of the economy, COVID, and the Russia crisis all underwater. The speech was supposed to be a reset. But now, a major rewrite is underway to address the war in Ukraine and the global response. And certainly, what we're seeing on the ground in Ukraine, the fact that the president has built a coalition of countries around the world to stand up to Russian aggression, to stand up to President Putin, to put in place crippling sanctions, that will be a part of what people will hear in the speech. Meanwhile, the president's predecessor teasing another run for office and breaking the cardinal rule for former presidents. Don't criticize the current president on foreign policy. The problem is not that Putin is smart, which of course he's smart, but the real problem is that our leaders are dumb. <laughs> dumb. So dumb. There is news tonight on the COVID vaccine. A new study casts doubt on the effectiveness of Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID vaccine on children aged 5 to 11. For parents of young children, unsettling news. New data from New York State shows the only COVID vaccine children 5 to 11 can take, made by Pfizer, offers almost no protection against infection. The findings have not been peer-reviewed, but researchers found the vaccine's effectiveness in that age group dropped from 68% in mid-December to just 12% by the end of January, as Omicron was spreading. 5 to 11-year-olds now less protected than teenagers. Today's news coming just days after the CDC relaxed its guidance on mask wearing. California, Oregon and Washington today saying mask mandates will soon end in schools. New York's governor announced the same yesterday. Today, some Connecticut students returned to class maskless. Just two weeks ago, Pfizer said it was postponing seeking FDA authorization for a vaccine for kids six months to four years old after trials showed it didn't work well. Now, today's news about the vaccine for five to 11 year olds not being as effective. Pfizer says it's now evaluating a third dose for children 5 to 11 years old. And vaccine makers are already developing new formulas, more effective against Omicron, as parents try to keep their children safe with different approaches and guidance evolving. Despite the odds, economically pressured Cuba has exceeded all expectations by producing five effective vaccines for almost all age groups within the country. With its significantly lower price point, it may be hope for all developing countries. Cuba, the small island country which has long stagnated under heavy U.S. sanctions, is finding outsized success 
in COVID vaccine development. Defying the odds, Cuba has quietly developed not one, but five of its own COVID-19 vaccines, inoculating children as young as two years old. Dr. Vicente Verres is the director of the Finlay Vaccine Institute, which has developed three of Cuba's five vaccine candidates, which, according to the Cuban government, has allowed it to tackle the pandemic differently than most countries. Cuba, after mass vaccination of children, end of November, zero deaths of children. Did you compare the Delta wave? 18 children died from that. That effort has led to one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. Over 90% of Cuba's population vaccinated with at least one dose, well above where the US and most European countries rank. So how is this country pulling it off? Cuba's investment in biotechnology began in the 1980s. Former President Fidel Castro envisioning Cuba as a nation of science. Massive state investments in public health have been paying off for decades with a national immunization program eliminating many diseases from the island. Cuba's vaccines use different technology to the mRNA vaccines developed by Pfizer and Moderna. They're protein-based and do not require special refrigeration. They don't need to be stored at minus 70 degrees, which for Global South countries is really important because it means that they don't have to also purchase the specialised um, refrigeration equipment. That's good news for the unvaccinated in poorer countries but with just two problems. Cuba has yet to ask the World Health Organization to approve emergency use of its vaccines, and few of their results have been published in peer-reviewed journals. We are uh, preparing to file uh, in order to get recognition by the World Health Organization. That is a lengthy and very cumbersome process. Cuba has said it will submit for WHO approval by the end of March. However, the country is already exporting its vaccines to at least four countries, including Vietnam, Syria, Venezuela and Nicaragua offering up the technology as well to countries like Iran to produce the vaccine domestically. The United Nations Climate Panel released a report with stern warnings that climate change may drastically change lives far sooner than the world would expect and insisted that humanity began preparations to fend against looming threats. Climate change is upon us and humanity is far from ready. A report from the UN Climate Panel warned on Monday whilst calling for drastic action on a huge scale. The major report is the latest in a series by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, detailing the global consensus on climate science. And this one focuses on how nature and societies are being impacted and what they can do to adapt. US climate envoy John Kerry lamented that too little has been done to adapt to climate change and said the report offered a blueprint for action. The IPCC said nearly half the world's population is already vulnerable to increasingly dangerous climate impacts. And a third to half of the planet needs to be protected to ensure future food and fresh water supplies. Adding that coastal cities need plans to keep people safe from storms and rising seas. But in some cases, the report acknowledges the costs of adapting will be too high. Governments drastically curbing emissions and adapting to a warmer world will take a lot of money spent on financing new technologies and institutional support. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says it is worth it. The report's release comes three months after global leaders highlighted the urgency of efforts to contain global warming to within 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit of pre-industrial temperatures. This latest warning says limiting global warming to close to 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit may not prevent losses to nature, societies or economies, but will substantially reduce them. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A man shot and killed his three children and a fourth person before taking his own life in an outburst of gun violence that unfolded in a church near California's capital. Investigators were seeking clues to a motive for the bloodshed but believe the shooting stemmed from a domestic dispute. Airlines braced for a potentially lengthy sanctions war after the EU banned Russian airlines and Moscow pledged to retaliate. The closure of EU airspace Russian airliners and the prospect of Russia shutting out airlines in response knocked airline shares. UN member states are meeting in Nairobi to agree plans for the first global treaty to tackle plastics pollution. 
Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam called for calm after residents emptied supermarkets, stocking up on produce ahead of plans for compulsory mass COVID-19 testing and amid rumours for a city-wide lockdown. Toyota has hit the brakes on production as the company fears a possible cyber attack may have affected the company in charge of supplying electronic components to the manufacturing process. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you've missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with eye-catching folk performances and light shows in celebration of the Lantern Festival in China. Thank you for watching. Good night.